Hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming to my channel. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, if you can hear a sort of rattling noise in the background, I don't know how audible that is. Um, I think there's some sort of nest in the framework of my house, my front room. I know there's uh, birds that come up there, so I think there's some sort of nest actually in there. It's almost like a, a tapping sign, so I don't know if you can hear that or not. I can. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, the comments that Whoopi Goldberg has made regarding the British Empire and slavery. Um, and I do wonder why she's jumping on this bandwagon. Um, I don't mean I, I expect more of her. Um, you know, it's not so long since she made those Holocaust comments. So it seems like she's got a knack for controversy in recent months. Um, but uh, I, I do want to say a few things around this because... It's an issue that keeps coming up. I mean, this is about Whoopi Goldberg, this particular story. But, you know, there's a lot of other people on the left or who have some um, anti-British narrative or sentiment. Uh, and this issue keeps coming up and coming up. So I think it needs to be challenged. But first of all, I'll read out the report. It's from GB News, notwithstanding what I previously said. Um, it's quite concise, so just bear with me. Uh, and the reports by Max Parry. Whoopi Goldberg, the US chat show host, has taken aim at the royal family over the empire and Britain's ties to the slave trade. Miss Goldberg attacked Britain for running ramshod over India for years. Um, she wants to check out India's record on black people, but Miss <laughs> uh, Goldberg's comments come as Prince William and Kate face protesters calling for slavery reparations in Jamaica. Uh, for a bit of context there, they've just done a tour of the West Indies and there were some protests and there was some degree of controversy. Let us not forget when we talk uh, about what needs to happen, all the folks that need to apologise to talk show hosts told The View. She went on, listen, this is not new. I suspect Charles, when he was in Barbados, had some idea because he went on and apologised. Yes, he was releasing the hold that Britain has, so perhaps someone is listening. And it's a new group of folks, I don't know if it's Charles, but one of them. Prince William had condemned slavery as abhorrent, has condemned slavery as abhorrent. He went on to say it should never have happened. Britain's Prince William, well that's a quote caption. Um, demonstrations have called on the royals to apologise for slavery. The trip has taken them from Belize to Jamaica and finally the Bahamas. The Duke of Cambridge did not apologise for slavery, nor did Prince Charles when he last visited Barbados. So she's got that wrong. During the Cambridge's visit to Belize, William quoted the Queen's 1994 speech to the Belizean Parliament. She said, I am proud to associate myself with your determination that social justice and personal freedom should flourish under the rule of law. It is always dangerous, however, to be complacent and to assume that democratic values will look after themselves. He went on, Her Majesty uh, went on to say that most of us, uh, most of all democracy, safeguarded by teamwork, the individual wills of all citizens, each pulling together towards the same objective. Sadly, elsewhere in the world, that vigilance is being tested today in Ukraine. Belize has joined many others in condemning the invasion and standing up for the principles of international law, peace and security. Today, we think of those struggling in Ukraine and we stand with them in solidarity. Right, uh, a few things to, a few talking points there. Firstly, um, William has said that uh, when he becomes king, he would um, support Republican movements, uh, not ideologically support them, but he wouldn't he wouldn't oppose them. He would you know, support those republics if they chose to become republics. Uh, from my point of view, of course, that is up to them. Uh, I think it would be sad if they cut their ties with Britain, um, but it is up to them. Last year, of course, Barbados become, became a republic. Um, there were some demonstrations, but, um, you know, the the royal couple was also greeted warmly in many places they went. Um, here's the thing. Um, wherever you think of the royal family, you know, there will be people who, uh, regarding all the other issues that have been brought up here, think that royalty as an institution should go, even if that's your view. I don't think anyone could fairly look at um, the Duke of Duchess Cambridge and not see two young people with the best motivations in mind. Um, you know, they're forward-looking, they're modern, they 
they're intelligent. I um I don't know how anyone could hold um contempt or hostility towards the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I really don't. Um, even if they feel the institution needs to go. Um, now on the issue of slavery, well, firstly, would be Goldberg. Um, needs to look at some facts. Yes, of course, Britain was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Of course, for a long time, it was a big part of our economy. And it's no secret that cities like Bristol um, and Liverpool um, became wealthy as a result. That's no secret. It's history. We can't deny it. Um, I am a little bit fed up of this issue being distorted. What do I mean by that? Well, the fact of the matter is that for most of the 19th century, the Royal Navy was policing the world's waters, intercepting slave ships. That's a reality. Um, and the reality is that when we talk about the slave trade, that's precisely what it was. It was a trade, a vile one, based on exploitation and extreme cruelty, but it was, um, it was an industry, right? Now, Europeans didn't come in and just take African slaves. They were sold. More often than not by African chieftains, um, perhaps there'd been local disputes, perhaps there had been some victory over another uh, tribe or uh, ethnic group. But this is one side of the slave trade that is always ignored. And of course, Goldberg's ignoring it. I think she's quite um, ignorant, actually, about history, just the way she's talking. Oh, one of them needs to say something. And um, I think she's ignorant in terms of um, some of the dynamics of this. I don't mean about slavery. Obviously, she's an African-American woman. She's going to have views on it. But I question, why is she opening up wounds? Why is she regurgitating this anti-British narrative whilst ignoring the fact that for decades, long before the United States, incidentally, we were actively uh, policing the world's waters against slavery? Why is she ignoring the role that Africans played? In fact, not just her. Everyone who brings up the transatlantic slave trade in the context of reparations or um, trying to shame and vilify the United Kingdom always ignores this point. And quite honestly, uh, there's a lot of dishonesty about this because if a white academic was to say that, even though it's a matter of fact, they would almost certainly face calls to be cancelled. They would be smeared as a racist, simply stating the fact Africans were complicit in the transatlantic slave trade. This is a reality. And frankly, um, I would say to black people who are outraged about the transatlantic slave trade, if you're outraged about it, be outraged about all of it. Be outraged that other Africans sold people into bondage, into, you know, the hands of white European traders. Um, so it frustrates me that that side is totally, utterly ignored. Um, another major issue is if the issue is about um, moral contempt about slavery, slavery happens today. Two of the worst offenders, although it's officially illegal, it still goes on, is Mauritania and Libya, two African countries. The irony of that is is quite poignant. Um, the issue about reparations, my question would be, well, how far back do you go? I mean, if you have Jamaicans or Belizeans today who are descended from slaves, which is, is very likely, how many generations would that be? Now, we abolished slavery across the British Empire in 1832. Within the United Kingdom itself, it was 1807. Across the British Empire, 1832, I think the Act of Parliament was 1833. 1833, that's 190 years ago. So we're not talking here about the recent past. We're talking now almost two centuries. And I get the argument that uh, the poverty was um, generational, that was associated with that. But, you know, for centuries after the Mongols sacked Baghdad, that city uh, took a long time to recover. 
So if you're going to make the argument that it's generational, uh, then you could argue oh, it should go on forever. The British should pay out for the rest of time, which is clearly absurd. Particularly as uh, in the case of Jamaica, it got independence in 1962. I've always argued a big part of independence is a degree of self-reliance. Now, I know that not all countries are equal. I'm not saying that uh, a great power is on a level footing with a developing country that has just got independence. But the thing about independence is it is about um, ultimately self-reliance as much as possible. And if you're arguing that a former colonial power should pay out for the rest of time, that's, I think, um, not realistic. Um, incidentally, uh, no other European power, as far as I know, pays out reparations to slavery. The Portuguese don't, the Spanish don't, the French don't, unless I'm mistaken. Um, but there's been empires throughout history. Slavery has been a reality throughout history. Yet for some reason, the transatlantic slave trade is the only one that's focused on. There's slavery today. There's exploitation today. Even in Britain. I mean, there was those two cases recently of um, men with, uh, with learning difficulties being exploited in the United Kingdom, including one up here in North East England. And uh, I was outraged at the lenient sentences the individuals in question got. But that is that's happening today. So these people that come out with their placards and they demand, um, well, in the case of countries like Jamaica, it's, uh, I think it's a cultural thing because that's, it's kind of, um, I think, part of the, the societal narrative. The British were our colonialists. They, you know, they owe it. But within the UK, when you get left-wing students, like the Colston Four, where, where if if they're so outraged about human rights and injustice, you know they're protesting or they protested over a statue commemorating a a man closely associated with the slave trade, um, who died two centuries ago, more than two centuries ago. Where it's the same level of outrage about that today? It's a selective outrage I have a problem with, and if you're going to protest something as evil as slavery. And let's make no mistake, that's what it is. Surely your priority should be slavery today. Surely that should be the priority. Um, because it still happens. Um, I personally think that there should be much tougher penalties for convicted uh, people, traffickers, and, um, and well, uh, the two cases that I cited, you know, they... The culprits in question got two or three years each. One of them apparently had a heart condition. You know, this is sort of leniency totally sends out the wrong message. In one case, a man had been held for something like 27 years or longer. Um, I forget the precise time, but it was a very, very long time. He was living in cramped, horrible conditions. He was paid a pittance. Um, it was basically slavery. Um... You know, so if if you're infuriated about what happened in 1780, but you're oblivious or you don't really care about what's happening today, I would question your moral compass. As for a wealthy American like Whoopi Goldberg, I mean, you know, she's done well. She's an African-American. Uh, she's been successful. She's rich and she's famous. Um, I'm not saying that she's calling for reparation for herself, but she is pushing this narrative and I question that I would say to Whoopi Goldberg if you feel so strongly about the subject will you call on the descendants of African chieftains to also apologize I don't think the current generation should apologize for things they have not done I don't believe that I think that the current approach that we take is the right one we should acknowledge it was evil we should acknowledge that we profited from it the empire was partly built on it. We should acknowledge that. We should be honest about the dark sides of our past. A confident nation is honest about its dark side, right? Um, in terms of reparations, I, I think within living memory there is a case for it, right? So, take for example civilians and the caveat um, being civilians who were tortured by British forces in Kenya during the Mau Mau uprising. Probably we should pay out. Okay. Um, yes, it was an insurgency. Yes, the Mama were killing 
uh, white settlers and Kenyans. Um, but we did torture civilians. There's no question about it. Um, and, you know, those survivors now, they're old. They're in their 80s and 90s. So I think, really, we could pay out. Because that is that's something that is within living memory. It's only the 1950s. So it's within living memory. Uh, there's also some things that we could do. For example, the Benin bronzes, um, which were looted. They were looted from the Benin expedition of 1897. Uh, we should probably return those. I mean, there isn't really any reason not to. Um, I've heard the argument that uh, it's better to have them in a secure place like the British Museum rather than a, a part of the world that might be unstable. But ultimately, you know, they have the moral high ground as theirs. That's, that's the bottom line. So I think, uh, and, and the Elgin Marbles as well, I think we probably should just return those things as a goodwill gesture. It's, you know, it's a festering issue that breeds anti-British sentiment. Uh, I think we should return it. Probably uh, there should be some caveat, like, uh, this is part of culture, uh, will it be protected, um, you know, and have an arrangement whereby um, maybe we could use part of the foreign aid budget to make sure that that's in a good facility, like a good museum or something. But um, I just mentioned that because we know that there are parts of the world that are unstable. Uh, for example, ISIS, when they took over in Iraq and Syria, damaged historic artifacts. Whereas if you have, uh, this as an example, ancient Sumerian um, artifacts in the British Museum, they're obviously going to be safer from the likes of ISIS. Uh, that's that's really the only argument I would say there is for keeping that stuff in um, in a Western Museum. So yeah, I think there's some things we could do. I think we could pay reparations within for cases within living memory. Uh, we can and we do acknowledge these things are wrong. But should we buy our head in shame and pay out millions with no end in sight? No, I don't think we should. Um, I think when it comes to the British Empire being taught in schools, and this is probably for another video, but I think it should be a balanced approach. Yes, let's look at the negative things. Look at the transatlantic slave trade. Look at Amritsar. Look at those bad things. But also look at the fact that the British Empire built the modern world. Westminster system of government, uh, infrastructure, rule of law all these things that positively change the modern world. Um, balance, that's all. I think there are left-wing activists who basically want to brainwash children into hating their own country and feeling that uh, the evil British went in and just killed everyone and that was it. It's not reality and it's, um, it's a distortion of reality. Um, as for Whippy Goldberg, unfortunately, you know, something like The View, it's going to be an echo chamber. I'm sure I didn't watch it. I couldn't be bothered quite honestly um but it's going to be an echo chamber of course she would have a she would have had a rapturous round of applause and you know it's all wonderful um you know, she speaks the truth but she needs to address those questions if she is talking about reparations does she extend that to the descendants of african slave traders after all without their complicity it would have been a lot harder i suppose you could argue Westerners, the British, the Portuguese, and so on, could have just went in and killed everyone and took the slaves. Um, yeah, they could have done that. But obviously it made it easier when there was local complicity. That's just common sense. And it's a side that is always ignored. Final point, when I talk about um, slavery in history that's ignored, the Barbary slave trade. How often do we hear about that? What about the descendants of white Europeans? Should they claim reparations from the descendants of North African Barbary pirates who literally kidnapped Europeans at the end of the 17th century, going right up to the early 19th century, I believe, um, kept them in slavery, and, you know, governments had to pay out ransoms until eventually it led to a conflict known as the Barbary Wars. I have a big uh, print of a painting in my bathroom, which is it's called the Bombardment of Algiers, 1803, and from the Barbary Wars. Um, which is basically European part had enough of this blackmailing. Um, it was kind of hostage diplomacy, actually, and they took action. Um, but that's a slave trade that is totally, totally ignored. And I will say there are some um, powerful black people who push this narrative that only slavery in history was the transatlantic slave trade. It's a lie. 
There's the Arab slave trade. There's the Barbary slave trade. There's the slavery throughout the Roman Empire. Um, slavery, unfortunately, has been a fact of history. And it's been found probably in every part of the world. Um, some Native American groups were engaged in slavery. So why is it there is this sole focus on the transatlantic slave trade? 